Welcome to our live webinar on how to be prepared for targeted industrial control system ransomware in manufacturing. Today's webinar is sponsored by Waterfall Security Solutions, Dragos, and Automation.com. My name is Renee Bassett, Chief Editor of Automation.com, and I will be your host. Ransomware targeting industrial control systems has emerged as a pervasive threat to manufacturing operations. In fact, in 2020, all plant downtime related to cyber attacks was due to targeted ransomware. The results were sometimes shutdowns that lasted for weeks. Worse, these attacks almost always took down multiple plants at once, overwhelming incident response teams and increasing the likelihood that the perpetrators could extort a ransom payment. Manufacturers must learn how to protect themselves. This webinar, is designed to provide some help. Our speakers are experts in operational technology, or OT, and they will explain the threat landscape for OT and automation systems in manufacturing and industrial plants. In the context of those threats, they'll then explore the challenges of securing specific systems, including manufacturing execution systems and ICS OT network and cloud connectivity. They'll also discuss an organization's tolerance for cyber risk. Then they'll reveal solutions such as how to use the ransomware kill chain to design defenses and other recommendations based on real world scenarios. Before we get started, please take a moment to acquaint yourself with the features of this GoToWebinar technology so you can submit questions to our presenters. On the right side of the screen, you will see a questions tab. Simply click the text box, type your question, and click send at any time. All questions will only be seen by me and our speakers. Once the main presentation is over, I will be asking our speakers to respond to as many questions as possible while keeping the overall presentation time to one hour. This presentation, including the questions at the end, is being recorded, and you will receive a link via email for viewing it later on demand. Now some background on our speakers. Dr. Jesus Molina is Director of Industrial IoT for Waterfall Security Solutions. He is a cybersecurity expert with years of experience in both OT and IT system security with a focus on manufacturing and critical infrastructure. A former hacker himself, Dr. Molina's early research involves offensive security for building automation systems. He also co-authored the Industrial Internet Security Framework, regarded as one of the most comprehensive studies on securing connected operational systems. Dr. Molina has a Master of Science degree and PhD from the University of Maryland and holds several security-related patents. His hundreds of article citations relate to intrusion detection, building security infrastructure, cloud security, and industrial Internet of Things security. He also co-organized the IoT Sandbox at the RSA conference, which displayed real-time hacks on everyday Internet of Things items. His co-presenter today is Dr. Tom Winston. His title is Principal Adversary Hunter for Dragos. Dr. Winston's cybersecurity expertise is focused on threats to critical infrastructure, including ICS and SCADA systems, foreign cybersecurity intelligence and threat analysis, mobile devices, and removable and fixed media digital forensics. He speaks more than a dozen languages and has extensive experience in international relations, intelligence, and foreign policy analysis as well. So now, without further delay, I'll turn the microphone after doc over to Dr. Molina so we can get started. Dr. Melita, you may need to unmute yeah, yourself. I'm, I'm here, I'm here, all right. All right, uh, well, hello everyone. Um, I am uh, going to put my screen on. Um, well, first, thanks Renee for the kind introduction. And uh, I will also 
I'd like to take this opportunity to thank automation.com for kindly hosting this webinar and of course to Tom uh, for accepting our invitation to provide his expert uh, knowledge on this very timely subject. I think uh, you will enjoy it uh, very much. And uh, we have a full agenda today. Uh, we will start with uh, exploring the manufacturing landscape. Um, I always believe this is important because I think that to defend operations, really you need to understand in how the operations work. So I will start with that. We will introduce uh, the ransomware in manufacturing. Uh, after that, uh, Tom will provide us a deep dive into the manufacturing threat and you're out for a treat. It's, it's very impressive. And uh, we'll end up with me uh, taking back the baton and uh, discuss recommended measures uh, to the reduce leader risk and considerations we see here at Waterfall that can improve um, segmentation in uh, manufacturing. So we have a full agenda, so I think we should just dive right into it. First, I will like to talk for a second about my company, uh, Waterfall Security Solutions. We have uh, been around for a long time in the OT space, uh, so much that we are now called by many uh, the OT uh, security company. We are deployed all over the world. Uh, we have thousands of sites and uh, we cover the spectrum of many industries. We are in facilities such as airports where we protect um, many of the largest airports in the world. We are in oil and gas. We are today in a lot of rail systems, including control centers and signaling systems. And of course, we are in uh, many manufacturing sites. With that, I will move to present you the first scary slide of the day. And I'm sure um, there will be many of these, mostly by Tom. I'll try to avoid to do that a lot, but Manufacturing sites has been the single most target OT industry by ransomware in 2020. As a result, uh, factories has been facing uh, downtime and that obviously translates into lots of uh, money losses. Attacks were increasingly hostile and sophisticated and uh, we have seen technologies uh, that were used in these ransomware attacks that only half a decade ago, five years ago, we could only see in nation state attacks. So the type of attacks have really got very sophisticated. These attacks affected all manufacturing industries, including plastics, pharma, food and beverage, cars, and electronic manufacturing. And with this, I would like to move to address probably one of the elephants uh, of uh, the room, which is not all manufacturing industries are the same. They have, um, under the blanket, the so world of manufacturing, we uh, see many differences. Uh, we first have different type of manufacturing models. Uh, we have uh, discrete, we have uh, batch, we have continuous, and all of these manufacturing models um, reflect in their service security measures how need to be protected. So there's quite a bit of difference on how to protect them. Well, we acknowledge these differences. Today, um, we're going to talk about the similarities. And I have to also say that all of these industries have been targeted of ransomware attacks and all of them have been success successfully targeted by ransomware attacks. Now, for the differences, you know, I worked with all of these uh, different industries. I can see, for example, plastic and foundry being continuous manufacturing usually has a big um, aspect of safety. Uh, they have usually a safety system or STS, and uh, it requires uh, the continuous manufacturing process requires not to be stopped. If it stops, then uh, there is a lot of problems to re um, continuous it or restart it. So there is a lot of safety requirements others such as pharma they require to have uh, continuous um, information sent to 
um, for its uh, continuous manufacturing, its batch production, and uh, they require to have continuous tracking and usually are dependent on the regulations of the country. So obviously there are differences, but today we're going to talk about ransomware. We're talking about the similarities. And um, for that, I'm going to start by discussing a little bit the physical operations uh, that we encounter in, in, in manufacturing, how they work and, um, and, um, and you know, this again for me is important because it's really difficult to defend a system if you don't really understand how this system works in particular operations. So let's start with the conveyor belt. This is usually the king of the manufacturing world is where you put the product and it moves around. It moves around and this product is changed by, um, by different machines. Um, these machines can be like cranes, can be robots, can be furnaces, basically thingies that change the product. Now let's call it that. These machines are what can be pressed, assembly, etc. Can are in turn they are be controlled by what we call like PLCs or programmable logic controllers. These are purely ICS systems that in turn they are controlled by human machine interface or HMIs. That's where the factory worker inputs the attributes required for each machine, how they have to handle the process, etc. In the not so recent past and in many less connected uh, factories today, that is it. You know, like you add the information into the HMIs and then you change the attributes depending. However, in more connected factories and usually in, in, in with the digitation, software has been added um, to do a variety of functions, but uh, in the most basic one is to orchestrate these different HMIs and to track and trace the product. These systems that, again, contain many functionalities are uh, called manufacturing execution systems. And usually they have attached some code of database or historians that collect information. We also have um, IT systems, which uh, the most important um, in the factory is the ERP or the Enterprise Resource Planning. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And then uh, we have other systems that are more cloud systems. We can have cloud overall equipment efficiency systems. Sometimes these OEs are embedded in the MES itself. Uh, we have predictive maintenance, digital twin of this new industrial IoT we have seen. Finally, another thing that uh, it's always sometimes overlooked is the fact that uh, OEM uh, vendors or the people that sell you the, the machines, the, these cranes, etc., usually require remote access. This is something very particular uh, of, of manufacturing and uh, sometimes they require access to one machine, but in some cases we have seen in my customers that they require access to a whole line, you know, that they actually own the firewall that access these lines and every week or every month they need to access the whole line to provide maintenance. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to work by example. And here in the right side, uh, you see an example of a factory. You see the PLCs, you see the HMIs, um, you see the MES, which is connected to the different HMIs. Uh, in this case, it has a database that is connected to an ERP system. And uh, we also have in this particular case uh, a cloud overall equipment efficiency system. Uh, this is very common in food and beverage, uh, but we can replace it with, mm, uh, you know, like a predictive maintenance or this very in right now or digital twin. And then we have a OEM vendor that requires access to one of the machines and, um, and, uh, and to the, the results of the, of, the, uh, of the MES. I'm going to carry this example across um, uh, the talk. Now, how ransomware works, I am going to just briefly start here and Tom will continue. Um, uh, usually, it starts with a phishing attack in the IT network, so in the upper layers. Uh, lately, we have seen also uh, it being started uh, by attacking VPNs and firewalls, and I, I know Tom is going to talk a little bit about it. And it keeps propagating step by step, uh, low into operations until it finds a viable target. So. To be much more concise, first, you know, there is some research and there can be social media, LinkedIn, show them. 
Google, etc., and then it keeps escalating um, until it delivers uh, the target. Now, I want to, before I move to Tom, I want to point out a couple of things that I think is very important. First, attacks of this kind doesn't happen one day. This is not Mr. Robot, where like you just go into your room and suddenly you are able to uh, extract millions of Bitcoins from somebody. It happens by mafias that uh, spend months planning the attack. So this takes time. So it's difficult to defend against it. The first stage, the RAT, what we call the Remote Access Trojan, is a very small program that is delivered into the enterprise through, again, phishing attacks or, or other uh, vulnerable targets. This only starts collecting information and it starts uh, communicating with um, Command and Control Center or C2 bidirectionally, and this is really important. It needs bidirectional connection to collect information and then keeps waiting for orders. Once it gets a viable target, then the command and control center or C2 will deliver the payload. And this is one thing I want to make very clear. The payload in other industries is complicated. You know, it's, uh, you know, it includes, for example, energy, try to, you know, take out the safety systems, try to disrupt something else. In ransomware for ICS, this payload, it's usually quite simple today. It can be just as easy as encrypting the database that contains uh, the repository of the MES. And that will, for example, in a pharma industry, will shut down because you cannot continue uh, creating product if that database is, is, is encrypted. Um, this disrupts the operations and uh, you, know, you cannot continue doing it, cannot have any way to track it. So payloads in manufacturing are quite more simple today that in other industries, and that obviously increases the risk enormously. Now I'm going to pass uh, the baton to uh, Tom. Uh, but you know, while we do the handout uh, process, uh, I would like to talk about a little bit the, in this really good um, 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 uh, uh, ebook that we have about the manufacturing sector. Uh, we saw that. One of the things we see that was more interesting, and Tom will explain, is like 100 of the compromised organizations that uh, were studied in this report have routable network connections into their OT environments all the way from the internet. And it was stunning, but uh, I'll let Tom explain a little bit to you more about the, the, the risk involved. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, at this webinar, and thank you, Waterfall Systems, for inviting me um, and Dragos. And um, I appreciate everybody at Automation.com for putting this together. <clears throat> so today, um, I'm going to carry on, car carry the baton, as uh, Jesus put it, um, and discuss a little bit more about why and how these. Um, attacks to manufacturing sector, actually to a number of sectors, um, really start with I, the IT. So the IT OT um, interface tends to be the the, um, the catch point. Um, so I'll just do a brief introduction about some of the things we look at. We'll look at some activity groups, um, some effective threats, a little bit of an update on uh, some of the stuff that uh, Dr. Molina was discussing regarding ransomware. Um, threat proliferation and some of the things that we we do. Um, first, a little bit about Dragos. Um, Dragos has a platform, comprehensive platform, um, that does monitoring and identification, asset identification, um, incident detection and response. The world view report is in-depth situational awareness of threat landscape. And the security services are expert guidance to combat and respond to adversaries, which include um, some advanced threat detection, as well as uh, a full complement of intelligence um, that we produce and evaluate for customers. So one of the things that we always sort of consider when we're looking at an attack or a group of attacks or a series of attacks uh, is the diamond model. And uh, typically with the diamond model, we have the, the capability, the infrastructure of the victims um, and the adversary. And if as intelligence um, sort of officers looking at these these attacks or, or a series of attacks or a series of incidents or events, um, if we see more than two, two or more of these um, sides of the diamond um, being touched, we will tend to create something called an activity group, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, but first, before we sort of get into that, um, we're, we're really more interested in um, Drago's sort of model 
operating model and our our tagline is sort of safeguarding civilization. So we're we're we're, we're less interested, honestly, in um, describing the actor or who you know which state nation state actor it is that's conducting the attacks. We're more interested actually in figuring out what we can do to help the sector or specific company that's being um, targeted. So here's an example of of an of a of a diamond model uh, AG. We have parasite here, and you can see that we have it's linked to another AG magnalium. Um, we we do try to figure out some historical view on this, um, and this is done you know through a number of methods using uh, third party services to search um, for existence of the malware prior to the date that we observed it. Because sometimes um, when we observe the activity or when we first um, discover the activity, it, it could have been actually happening for some time before that time period. So, so if we see, so we'll look at infrastructure, we'll look at, um, you know, are they, are they looking at the infrastructure by accident or are they intentionally looking and targeting um, this particular sector, whether it's manufacturing, oil, natural gas, electricity? Um, and that's a difficult thing, actually, from an intelligence perspective it's it's one thing to find activity that seems to be targeting uh, operational technology in an organization. It's another thing entirely different to actually determine if it was intentional or if it was accidental. So this is something that this is something we use the diamond model to actually help refine and um, describe to to a degree that allows us to, to make some sort of assessment about um, you know what the capabilities are, what 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 the victimology is, and things like that. And some of our some of our targeting groups uh, for over the past four years are um, listed here. We have Xenotime, Electrum, um, Hexane, and, and and a few others, um, Parasite, and we can look at those a little bit here. So, in order to actually define what sort of activity we're observing, um, we we will mine information from a multitude of open sources, and we will combine that information into technical reports or analytic advisories or assessments um, just so that we can sort of see uh, you know what what are we what are we seeing here do we have can we do some reverse engineering on some of the malware we've captured can we um, you know pull some strings can we write some yara signatures and then we want to kind of try to figure out how the adversary is operating one of the things that's interesting with um, ICS OT attack vectors um, nation states typically will spend a lot of time, effort, and energy in money, and I think Dr. Molina uh, referred back to this actually. Um, that's not. Uh, it's, this isn't a 14-year-old uh, child hacking in their basement. Um, typically, this is a much more concerted effort. And what we usually see in these concerted efforts is uh, malware that changes over time and is reactive to mitigations and implication. Uh, you know. Um, yeah, mitigations put in place to prevent further implication um, for the organizations which they're targeting. So we are less we are less concerned about who's actually doing the activity, although it does it does come up. But um, Dragos really focuses more on sort of let's let's figure out how they're operating. Let's look at how the malware has um, you know evolved over the last six months, year, two years. And um, and we always use the we always use the diamond model for the basis of intrusion analysis. So Chrysene is one of the first um, uh, it's, it's an older AG uh, 2017 and it we we assess that it's going to continue conducting um, IT compromise. And this is this is actually the big point here is that um, the IT, any existing problem in the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure in any organization, and again, it's cross sector, cross vertical, um, is going to create trouble for um, anything that, that is OT connected. What becomes interesting is if an adversary decides to exercise further um, one of those vulnerabilities that they discover to, to poke at the the OT part of the network, or what we would refer to as the lower um, three layers of the Purdue model, um, layer zero through um, two, that tends to be the thing that is, is much more interesting um, from our perspective. So this uh, AG um, Chrysene, of course, uses IT compromises. Um, we assess that they're gonna continue to develop and refine their capabilities, including disruptive malware, um, Chrysene will likely attempt to improve its ability to achieve stage two intrusions. 
and crisine develops the most dangerous course of action that we would predict is that crisine develops and deploys ot disruptive or destructive capabilities and some of the um some of the capabilities are watering holes uh, victimology is oil and gas manufacturing in middle east north africa and north america and some of the some of the some of the attack activity is connected to um, oil rigs Xenotime is uh, probably something that more people are familiar with. Uh, this is, we assess they're going to ex continue to expand targeting other industrial verticals. Um, will continue its efforts of compromising IT networks to gain access to OT environments. And recent disclosures will cause Xenotime activity to slow while activity group retools. So um, the Xenotime was the Trisys TriConnects um, crash override. I think that's probably a, very, a much more familiar term um, for, for folks listening. Um, and the victimology was oil and gas, electric, Middle East, Europe, and um, APAC, Asia Pacific. So, um, so the mitigations have been put in place. The TriConnex um, controllers have been fixed and changed, but likely they're the the group that's conducting this activity is looking to retool and conduct further activity, and we're watching for that. Parasite is another as a VPN compromise, um, and we know that. A lot of us rely on VPNs to securely connect to our organizations, especially um, with the pandemic. People are working from home more frequently. So we, we look at this. This is VPN compromise of the IT networks looking to conduct reconnaissance. Um, one of the links is to Magnalium, which is another uh, AG. And they exploit known VPN or SSH um, vulnerabilities that exist. And again, that's that's an, an, an initial access vector that we would watch. Um, if it's accidental, it's not terribly interesting to Dragos. If it's if it's happening and they, they're going further into the network, um, we see lateral movement and later things in the MITRE attack chain thing happening, then yes, we would investigate it further. Uh, Magnalium is another um, IT network information gathering. Um, and again, a lot of these, uh, a lot of nation state actors will conduct large information gathering operations um, prior to conducting the actual attack. So this this is a, a something that we always are watching for, um, likely to develop and refine its IT capabilities while improving its ability to achieve stage two. Of course, stage two is is actually impacting directly the um, the operational technology in an organization. And last night's another one that falls into that um, sort of category of IT compromise. Um, and the victimology is a little different here. It's the, the, the vertical is definitely different, nuclear, energy, oil and gas. And of course, Xenotime um, targeted several ICS vendors. It wasn't just um, Schneider Electric, it was uh, several others. Affects supply chains of all industry verticals and um, provides vendor enabled access to IC networks. So this is, this is something that we're gonna see um, with uh, ransomware. We'll actually see it with ransomware and we, we actually see that um, this sort of trend of of, of um, the solar winds breach, which is coming up in a, a couple slides here, uh, is using it's exercising existing supply chain operations. In other words, um, solar winds issued an update to their software, but the software update had contained the malware, and this happened many many months ago, uh, and it just happened silently, and everybody thought it was okay, but actually, in fact, it was installing, you know all sorts of trouble for many, many organizations, many verticals actually. So, so when we talk about ransomware, we see ransomware being the, um, the primary sort of focus uh, is of late for the manufacturing sector. In fact, in this year alone, we've seen several instances um, of companies that have been hit by ransomware, Molson Coors, uh, Honeywell, Acer Computers, just a few, just to name a few. Um, and the ransom, it's not clear, Typically, it's not clear whether they're paying the ransoms or not, um, but we do see in some instances, um, and I'm not going to mention the company specifically, but we do see the information that was stolen during the credential harvesting or file harvesting um, operations of the ransomware actors. Uh, we see that dumped into a DLS dump leak site in the dark web. I mentioned solar winds already. Um, there's some evidence that's still active. DHS CISA has been releasing tools to find, seek out, and destroy instances of this. Chirp was the first tool. Um, Aviary is the second. Um, we've definitely seen an, an increase in ransomware attacks, though, in the, really in the last four months. It's, it's, it seems to be the main story, actually. And unfortunately, these ransomware attacks are very disruptive to um, not just production, manufacturing, um, but also uh, distribution and things like that. So it, 
it's becoming, I think it's becoming sort of the, the, the theme for 2021 um, is ransomware and ransomware actors. We see actors like Klopp and Reevil um, continuously sort of using their um, ransomware tools to, at this point, just not so much attack uh, OT networks, but more uh, harvest information from the companies, including contracts and personally identifiable information of the employees and things like that. So we have these unknown actor ransomware events of Molson Coors and Honeywell, um, steal sensitive data, and then threaten threaten everybody to dump it, um, which is not good. I mean, it's, it's corporate confidential material, obviously, that's no good for the organization. Um, and they put them on dump sites, dump leak sites, and there's a, a number of them in the dark web uh, realm that sort of look at these. Um, and any the other thing that we see, especially with the work from home arrangements, and I'll kind of I'll move a little quicker through this, um, targeting remote services. A lot of organizations now have remote monitoring in place so that um, they they may allow their employees to work from home. We saw just a couple months back in Old, Oldsmar, Florida, um, the Oldsmar water, Municipal Water Facility was attacked um, through a, a known team viewer uh, vulnerability. Um, team viewer is a tool that was originally used by gamers to communicate, but it's, it's now used by um, companies to allow for remote work. This was actually a very much an OT attack. Um, somebody was able to get onto the, an unknown actor was able to get onto the, um, the HMI and change the chemical put into the water for purification. Um, we determined that this, the Oldsmar water vulnerability was actually um, discovered by a botnet. So the botnet found the credentials, harvested the credentials, and then, and then an actor, whoever may be the control over the botnet, it's not clear, um, decided to uh, go further. So some of the other things um, we do see, we, we do monitor very carefully, as I mentioned before, increasing government investment, meaning any government investment, foreign government investment, um, in research and development to disrupt OT operations. Um, and, and again, with the Oldsmar incident, that was, we don't know whether that was accidental or, or intentional, and we don't have any insight at this time as to whether that is a, a large scale problem that we're not aware of, or if it's an isolated problem. Um, so there, so the asset owner and operator consequences, of course, um, they're not limited to individual verticals. So this is this is an important point too. We're looking at um, something we see working in the oil and natural gas sector may also be applied in the electric sector. So we're, we're, we're pretty much mindful of those things. Um, we always encourage resilience, defensibility and recovery, um, identify assets, environmental awareness, um, be prepared for the breaches, just like we said, just like the, the title of the <laughs> of the um, the webinar today. Be prepared. It's, it's, it's so so very true. Um, threat behavior detection, ICS specific threat intelligence can be leveraged to identify unique behaviors um, and recovery and investigation response and recovery. Defenders must leverage all available information to sort of know what they're doing. And with that, I'll I'll pass the baton back to Dr. Molina, and I thank you all again for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. That was amazing. I mean, it's just always so intriguing. How do you guys find all that stuff? You know, I'm like, I'm always saying, like, where do you get all that data? Um, but extremely interesting. And again, if you have a chance to just uh, download um, the report from Dragos about uh, the manufacturing sector, they even have another one about um, ransomware in industrial control systems that is also really good. Um, I want to point out what he said is like a lot of vulnerabilities that are found and a lot of attack vectors right now start with VPNs and other um, systems that are supposed to protect. So just with that, you know, we are going to, I want to move to, um, now we have seen the threats, we have seen um, the risk environments. What can we do about them? What is the track of action? Obviously there is something uh, in manufacturing that, that um, that is not working properly. Um, what we recommend first and foremost is to separate business from operational critical systems. And this usually is done like in a whiteboard. And like you start like looking at your systems and try to understand better what are operational critical and what ones are business uh, systems, uh, often related to IT. This is quite complicated in a, in in uh, in 
in manufacturing. And this is because of like, there is a lot of software that actually is treated as IT, but you know, as uh, Tom explained before, if it's targeted, suddenly there is the OT system, OT is, in, is impacted. Uh, so this is the first step. The second step, and this uh, also Dragos, and we had like a, um, a a webinar like a month ago with Dragos about uh, this specific item is like to inventory systems and their communications. And you know, companies such as Dragos or others have tools that can extract information. And actually, Waterfall provides the enablement with that. We have the Waterfall for IDS, which allows you to put uh, one of our systems that start extracting information from your network, is to automatically look at what systems do you have. You cannot defend what you don't know. So this is the second step to have at this inventory of systems and importantly, how they communicate. The third is to prioritize uh, production systems. And this is uh, looking at that historian and that database or that UPCL UA server, which right now is barely protected and will be the primary target from a ransomware attack. Uh, this is uh, prioritizing it is, is uh, the third step. Finally, segmentation today uh, traditionally has been done using firewalls. This doesn't follow many of the current trends like zero trust and uh, importantly doesn't do it defense in depth. Once you bypass one of your firewalls, even if you have DMC, most likely the second firewall will be bypassed. Maybe not today, but again, these attacks take months. And once a credential is acquired, many credentials will be acquired. We suggest the use of universal gateways to augment, I would say, your security defenses. And I will explain these steps with our example that we have seen before, like how this works. And the first step, I think it's the most complicated and the most misunderstood when it comes to manufacturing. You know, in industries, there's a clear separation between IT and OT. You really know when you go to energy, this is the OT systems, this is the IT systems. In manufacturing, the lines have blurred. And more now with the cloud, with the digital twin, with the predictive maintenance, you know, it's really difficult to understand what systems are critical for operations and which are not. There are some that is basic. HMIs, PLCs are basically OT systems. You need to protect them as OT systems. Manufacturing execution systems, it really depends on what are you doing with the MES. In Newer smart plants we are working in, they have a differentiation between operation MESs, which are real-time operations, order execution, track and trace. These and the databases that are related to these are uh, operations. Now, from the business side, we have the ERP, the PLM, the business MESs, and these business MESs can be predictive services, overall equipment efficiency, aesthetical process control, and others. Also, I have seen that in some other factories, ERP systems are looked as OT just because they are tightly connected with the MES. So, in general, you need to look what systems, if they are down, they will impact operations. In well-defined you know, uh, plants, you know, uh, the MES will be divided into business critical and operational critical. In our example before, uh, you can see here that the, the HMIs and the PLCs obviously are in this bucket, which is the, um, the operations. And in this case, the MES and the database, in this case, let's say it's an OPC UA database, which is very classic to see, um, are all operations. If they are targeted, the operations in the factory need to stop. The ERP system is feeding from that database. The cloud OE or, or operative efficiency is connected or collecting information from the HMIs and uh, the database. And the OEM vendor has access to the systems. But these three systems, the ERP, the cloud OEE, and the OEM vendor are business systems and they should be treated as such. Tom has referred to these four levels that uh, are referred to in IIC uh, 62443. So, a small comment about IEC 62443 is that it's a great comprehensive standard and we all look at it um, with admiration. However, I have to say that in manufacturing, um, it's usually quite frankly, not well taken, not well distributed on what are the functionality and which actions will affect the process. 
Tom talked about level two, the control systems, but you know, the truth is that level three, the manufacturing operations, often, you know, if attacked, they will, um, they will impact uh, the systems. OEM vendors, and I would say remote access right now, um, the, this VPN that uh, Tom was referring, goes all the way to level two from the cloud. And this obviously is creating not only a nightmare to defend, but also a nightmare to make the firewalls um, act correctly. You have to open out of ports, and it's really difficult to, in a factory, in an OT system, to control. So this inventory of systems that we talked before, uh, and this uh, looking at the data flows, is critical. In this case, we look at the MES, and you can see that this MES needs to have bidirectional communication all the time. Uh, with the different HMIs, the PLCs, etc. And it reports and puts all the information to this database that is an OPC UA. This OPC UA system is contacted by the ERP systems, the cloud OE, and um, the OEM vendor in turn has a VPN that access the HMI. Now we see all these flows, and you can separate these flows between business data flows and operations data flows. Usually this is protected by using a DMZ is called with two firewalls between level three and level four, or just one firewall. And sometimes we have what is called um, a firewall, uh, that is an industrial firewall in level two and level three. This is a traditional way to, to, um, to, to protect your systems. But usually we're seeing a lot of issues with this traditional segmentation that has been exploited uh, by malware, um, ransomware uh, attacks uh, all the time. And I'm going to explain in the next one, which is the issues of traditional segmentation. First, this traditional segmentation, and we can see that in the report from Dragos, um, creates a routable path in many times between a VPN system all the way to the ICS or all the way to layer three where this OPC UA database is, and hence is able to just, just in one shot, the rat is embedded or um, you know, use the vulnerability of VPN, send to um, the IT, they escalate the attack, bypass the DMC using um, the credentials that they have been stolen, and that's it. You can deploy the payload, and then uh, you have a factory that is not uh, operable. Because of this explosion of functionality on the MES, and the fact that now we have cloud vendors that offer OE and other offer predictive maintenance, we have like, uh, all you can see from Predix to Amazon, they are offering systems to do all these uh, fancy things. All this requires access somewhere or another to the ICS. And because of this, while these systems can be end-to-end, -end extreme secure, use encryption, use the best of the of the brand, the truth is that firewalls are misconfigured and mismanaged uh, to allow this access of these APIs. This is a complex thing to defend because now we have such a big uh, and expansive uh, uh, number of protocols that are entering uh, your, uh, your 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 systems. In manufacturing, and that doesn't happen in other things traditionally, uh, there is a lack of defense in depth. Uh, there is a monoculture of firewalls as a perimeter defense, and uh, it's this uh, use of the DMC, um, which uh, requires these two firewalls to be synchronized, updated regularly, and this doesn't happen. I have been in plants where the firewall configuration has been taken for like years ago. And finally, like we have seen that the simplest ransomware payloads uh, can make damage, even IT-ish attacks as, OT, as, as, uh, as Tom uh, described, you know, can uh, put a factory down. So you really need to increase your defenses. So we have to evolve our segmentation needs, and this is coming from traditional traditional defenses, which is uh, having internet routable critical assets, blacklisting of ports and policies that depends on the factory, to more modern, which are non-routable critical assets. Um, they focus on one list of data and are consistent and hardware enforced. What my company like um, uh, provides is uh, universal security gateways, which is um, a combination of hardware and software. Um, the hardware provides the security. Uh, unlike firewalls that provide the security in software, uh, universal security gateways provide 
uh, the security using hardware. This is because they only send data in one direction. It's using a laser that sends information and a receiver that receives it. Data can only travel in one direction. With that, we have two at the sites in the industrial network and in the corporate network, we have software that moves the data. And this is done in a totally different way than a firewall. Rather than open a port, what we do is we collect the information, for example, a historian, uh, OPC UA, as we see in the example, and create an exact replica of this OPC UA in real time in the corporate network. Now, every system, every IT system can fit from this replica. And you don't need to go to the IECS network to collect the information. So the next one gateway is mm, have this zero trust approach to cyber security where you just move the data, create replicas of the information, and then the corporate network can use this information. One question that uh, arises is like, well, what do you support? Uh, we have been in the business for like now more than 12 years. So we have created many, many different uh, connectors which are able to replicate information from any, anywhere, from Wonderware, from uh, OSI of Pi, uh, OPC UA, OPC DA, we can do everything. We can, one of our most uh, demanded uh, connectors is for remote screen view. So remotely, the OEM vendor can look at the HMIs uh, have replicas of these HMIs in real time. You can see what the person uh, operator is doing in real time. So we're able to replicate information and send it one way. One concern I heard quite a bit in manufacturing is the fact that data cannot be sent back. And this is actually not true. It was true maybe five or 10 years ago, but the actual gateways now provide capabilities, hardware capabilities to overcome this problem. Um, we have what is called the secure bypass that is used for by a lot of OEMs, but also we have the waterfall flip, which is a kind of inertial security gateway that reverses, uh, reverses in a timely manner. And uh, this is much used in the smart plants where it reverses every night for like 10 minutes and it's still one way, but now it replicates information from the corporate network to the industrial network that's used to send uh, patches, AV updates, etc. Now let's look at our um, initial uh, example. In this case, rather than having these flows cross layer four to layer three, the operator have decided to replicate this OPC data database um, unidirectionally. So the waterfall is set in between level three and level four. There's a replication of this information that now can be used for the clouds. Uh, the ERP system can fit from it too. And in the case of the OEM, OEM vendor, um, if the um, terms of agreement allows it, and in many cases it does, uh, rather than connect directly, it can connect to the replica of the OPC UA and also to the HMI. The HMI obviously is operated remotely by uh, internally by the operator, but the vendor can do can see everything that the operator is doing, and hence it can coordinate with him a time to talk in the phone and say, okay, I want you to modify this, check that, that's fine, and that's it. So it doesn't need to enter in your system in random times and uh, it's a much better way because it can be at any time these HMIs are accessible all the time to them so they can uh, and a VPN attack to this vendor will not cause harm uh, to your infrastructure. Now for concrete examples we have seen a lot of examples in uh, in uh, um, uh, brownfield factories where they really want to um, use cloud systems, but the factory obviously, you know, will be very uh, open to attacks if that happens. We see a lot of replication of OPC UA using directional gateways, and then this is, this replica is uploaded or like uh, use an API uh, to be used in the cloud. We see that in predictive maintenance systems, and we see that in overall equipment efficiency. So this is one way to have a single source of truth for all your factories or some of your lines and put this information into a repository where other external entities can use or you internally can use with more ease. Another thing we have seen a lot is uh, the use of smart manufacturing. In this case, you have more a greenfield system where you can, from the start, create a sound security policy. You divide your MES uh, between two MESs, MES that requires have direct connectivity to HMIs and PLCs and other part of the MES systems or cloud systems 
that's you know doesn't require like only read read only uh, information from that you replicate the database and every day or every time that you want from the ot you trigger a flip and then you start putting information back and that can be again patches or can be um, schematics or new attributes that uh, the plm has devised for the factory so we have seen that a lot in, in new manufacturing manufacturing plants coming online and trying to create a model where um, their security policy is more uh, concrete, specific, and it has not to be maintained, as has to be with firewalls and UXO gateways, and the fleet provides that. All right, so in conclusion, ransomware breaches appear almost weekly. Tom talked about the risk. Um, this happens even with traditional security designs and firewall networks. We provide recommendations, um, which basically are identify your systems, create an inventory of communications, prioritize what is important, and try to segment your networks properly. And this is trying to provide uh, a look at zero trust systems, a look at um, having a defense in depth, and interactional gateways um, provide this defense in depth and uh, hardware security based on, on zero trust. And this really makes a difference on, on, on how you, you sleep at night. We are releasing in the next 10 days, I promise, a book uh, which is called Target Ransomware New Defenses. Uh, this will provide these examples I carried, but also more information about specific industries. And that's it for me. I would like to uh, now open for Q&A. Um, my email is there. there. Uh, I added Winston, uh, Tom, uh, emails there too. And um, I'm happy to respond to any questions. I'm so happy to, to, to have the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you, Dr. Molina. And thank you, Dr. Winston, for that very insightful presentation. Now, listeners, it's time for your questions. We have had a number of of them come in already but as a reminder use the question tab on your screen to type in any questions you might have for our um, speakers today and uh, we will get to as many as we can uh, while time allows so um, here's a question about the gateway you mentioned dr molina the re listener says Unidirectional gateways assume all data flow through the gateway. Technology such as NFC open backdoors, which I do not see clearly addressed in the approach discussed. What's your advice on how these technologies should be controlled? The first thing is that unidirectional gateways do not allow all the data to cross. Uh, this is not a blanket data diode. Unidirectional gateways, what they do is replicate information. And so uh, when we go to your network, we say, what is the information you need to replicate? For example, you need to replicate a historian. We just replicate the historian. No other data is sent. No other data is allowed to be extracted out of your network. So we work, the original gateway, what it does is it collects the information from the different sources that you tell us that are important to us. And we not only replicate databases, we also replicate obviously files, you know, and we can replicate um, even Modbus, for example, we can do uh, replication of that so you can see microservice in the other side that um, look like your devices. So we create replication of whatever uh, that's done. In the IT, there is no way data can travel back. Uh, there, even if there is an attack that is uh, fatal for every other system, the Unixel gateway will resist because it's hardware um, what makes it work, you know, like the cybersecurity is provided by hardware. It's only one way, so any attack from IT system will not work. And we have, have many people trying to hack into it, but it's just physically impossible to just go that direction because it's physically impossible. Okay. Um, and a follow-on question to that is, what's the difference between your gateway solution compared to traditional DMZ decoupling and data diodes? Okay, I did that like that, that I got, it's just the hardware, just that thing that sends information. And usually data diodes are very non-sophisticated systems that use UDP. So you just like send information. And if that's all what you want to do, send UDP in one direction, you can use one of these cheap data diodes. 
Inertial gateways is a combination of, of, of hardware and software, and they work and complement each other. We have a lot of things that make it more resilient, more redundant. So if you use a packet, you can actually look and like see that the packet is lost, even if you cannot obviously go the other direction. So this is a combination of the software that collects the information and you know and makes a replica. For example, there is no data diode that can be make a replica in real time of an OSI soft historian. This is a very complex thing, and we work directly with OSI soft in order to use their API, collect information, send it one way, and then create an exact replica. And this is really sophisticated. And obviously, we have hardware that data diodes doesn't have, you know, that like you know, like the flip that reverses or a secure bypass, which is able to, um, you know, when an OEM vendor requires, it can bypass the directional gateway by hardware. So we have like a lot of different hardware systems and, and software that combines with it. At DMC, it is complicated, I would say. At DMC has, is basically two firewalls, and two firewalls are just two firewalls. I mean, uh, you put two firewalls, and then in the middle, you put what you say a decoupling, which is usually a bastion host, but you have to know, you have to have like a team to be able to, to have the two firewalls work correctly. The bastion host needs to be correctly addressed. And we have seen DMCs bypassed all the time uh, because once you have the credentials for one, usually you have credentials for others and the bastion host doesn't do anything in the middle. So this decoupling, it's a still software. You still are using the software to defend your system. You need to maintain it. So if you have a team behind it and they are very good and they know what they are doing, DMCs can work very well. But you know it's complicated to set up. Gotcha. Um, how do you prevent data integrity breaches in your solutions, i.e., data in data integrity controls like digital signatures, hashing, or encryption? Uh, well, data integrity. Um, breaches, as you say, um, is basically corrupting your system. If you don't allow this payload to arrive to the place that needs to be corrupted, it's not going to be. How ransomware works, and Tom can like talk a, all day about it, is you have a rat, which is a, a remote access trojan. It talks bidirectionally with a common control center and doesn't have a payload, doesn't, it's not a big thing. It's just like a very small system that basically connects with a C2, uh, like a remote server of the bad guy. And the bad guy slowly, along weeks, start understanding how your thing works. At some point, we'll deploy a payload, which is that data integrity breach that you say, like encrypting your database or something else. But first, it needs to arrive to the point that he can do that. So what we prevent is this rat to access the systems that are going to put down your operations. And even if the rat is, is, even if you put a USB drive and connect this rat directly to your uh, ICS, which is people say, well, maybe you can do that too by an internal, it will not be able to do anything because it doesn't have a way, this is not a bidirectional connection. You don't have a route to the internet with these rats is going to work. So the rat is going to sit there and do nothing. So even for that, our virtual gateways will be able to prevent this kind of attacks. Okay. Um, this one is uh, possibly for Tom in the um, security incidents examples that you mentioned. Um, how much of them involve social engineering aspects compared to technical penetration methods like Trojan scripts and other things? Um, it's a good question. It, it's always a concern, certainly. The insider threat is never should never be underestimated and underplayed. And social engineering can be just general social engineering uh, via social media forums, or you know even a conversation in a coffee shop, or it can be organized espionage. And in either case, the the results are catastrophic. It's it's difficult to detect. It's difficult to um, track. And there are plenty of uh, sort of evidence. There's plenty of evidence out there of instances where um, these social engineering um, operations were successful. Now, in regards to that specific question, it's never actually clear um, what what was involved. Um, that re would require a lot of in-depth insight inside the organization during the time of the attack or, or maybe before the attack. Um, but it's something that we certainly look at and um, Dragos is gonna be producing a white paper very soon on this this particular topic actually, because it is, 
it's it's bad for anybody. It's bad for any organization to have an insider um, who has access and a badge and who's recognized by everybody as an employee there. Um, but but in the OT um, sector, it it has a different sort of um, sheen to it. I think that may be a little worse because um, controlling processes that affect not just you know a company or a couple people in the company, but you know maybe tens of thousands of people. Um, that's a that's a much more scary uh, proposition. So it's definitely something that we we at Dragos are, are looking at uh, all the time, figuring out um, better ways to detect insiders. And there's a lot of research that's already been done on that as well. So I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you very much. And um, we are just about out of time, so I am going to have to um, relegate the additional questions to be answered via email in a, at a future time, because um, I want to be mindful of our time here. Um, is there anything, uh, Dr. Molina or Dr. Winston, you'd like to leave our readers, our listeners with as a closing statement before we um, leave today? Well, for me, just thank you very much for the time. Uh, we'll be releasing this um, ebook uh, in the next 10 days, so you will find it. Uh, so that's why we're not sharing the slides. The ebook is going to be, I think, much more comprehensive uh, and will include all the diagrams. Um, but thank you very much for your time, and I hope it has been useful. And thank you, Tom, so much for your for your uh, for your insights. Likewise, Dr. Molina, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak and. Um, I, I appreciate the time as well, and I thank everybody for listening. And again, look for um, the white paper regarding insider threat from Dragos in the coming weeks. Excellent. Thank you both for an excellent presentation. And to our listeners, I want to remind you that if you missed any portion of this webinar or would like to re-listen to it, it will be available on demand. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive an email linking to the recording um, as well uh, that will also include information on the upcoming ebook that Dr. Molina mentioned. You'll also receive a post-webinar survey and I hope you'll take the time to fill that out and just give us your feedback so we can continue to improve the process going forward. On behalf of automation.com, Waterfall Security Systems and Dragos, I thank you for your attention today. This concludes our presentation.